Good afternoon, everyone. As you get settled, you can take a look and see that we've got a couple of tools for you to use today. Our Q&A and our chat are both going to be open to you. And we'll get started in just a moment. Lots of folks still coming in. Welcome, welcome. And if you've been here before, welcome back. We'll get started in just a minute. Get settled, get comfy. We're gonna to be together for about an hour today. As you get comfortable, um, if this is your first time with our San Diego 101 series, welcome. If it is a return visit for you to San Diego 101, our virtual monthly online series here, um, welcome back. A special thank you to our members and our donors who make this possible. Um, we'll get started with Susan Hector in just a moment here. As you look around the Zoom room, um, please keep in mind that if you have a question as it comes up to you, go ahead and type it into our Q&A. That should be one of the functions down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you've got something to um, connect to or a comment or want to say hello, please use our chat box. If you've got a question, use that Q&A. Something else, put it in the chat. We don't want to miss any of your questions. We'll hopefully have time for some of those right at the end. And we'll get started in just a minute. Our numbers are starting to settle. All right, we're slowing down and it is 12.02. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, I'm Sam Alberts. I'm with the San Diego History Center uh, Education Department. So you've probably seen me before if you've been here. Um, otherwise, hi, welcome. And Susan Hector is going to be talking to us today about California women of Old Town San Diego. As I mentioned, we'll be together for about an hour. Um, she's planning to talk for about 45 or 50 minutes and then we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards. So if a question occurs to you, you can pop it into the Q&A box and we'll hold on to it till the end, or you can hold it to the end and hope it gets answered. It's up to you. Um, you can also ask any questions about the History Center or about any aspects of, of this topic or um, this area that, that come up to you too. So we'll do our best to answer all of those as time permits. Um, we are going to jump right in, so I will, turn off my mic and video and turn it over to Dr. Hector. Well, good morning, everybody. Actually, I guess it's good afternoon now and happy International Women's Day. I think the topic today is very timely considering that it is International Women's Day today. We're gonna to be talking about the California women of Old Town San Diego. Next, please. Californios lived in San Diego when it was part of Mexico between 1821 and 1850. The women of Californio families combined native, Spanish, and American lifestyles to make this period of American history one of our most diverse and culturally significant. My presentation focuses on the Californio families associated with adobe homes and sites that you can go visit in Old Town San Diego State Historic Park. And that was really one of my motivators for this presentation to tell you about some of these places where you can actually go and physically visit where these women lived and raised their families. Towards the end of the presentation, I'm also going to mention some of the other women in addition to the California families who lived in San Diego during this period and afterwards. This photograph shows Old Town San Diego and most of the adobe homes of the women we will be discussing. The Machado E. Stewart home is not, oops, sorry about that, <laughs> surprise you there. The Machado E. Stewart home is not visible in this photograph because it's behind that tall building on the left. 
When you read about the Californios, you rarely learn anything about the women of that time and place. The California women of San Diego are part of the hidden history of women. History books and dramatic paintings highlight soldiers, mountain men, and vaqueros. The men who interviewed 13 California women in contrast to 78 men, for historian Hubert Howe Bancroft asked them about battles, power struggles, and political intrigue. A few of those women managed to mention their own lives and perspectives, but for the most part, the interviews were controlled to exclude this material or it was edited out later. Until recent research, our only knowledge of women was through associated men. A good example is the notable San Diego businessman, Lewis Rose. Donald Harrison, writing in the Journal of San Diego History, referred to him as perhaps our first local supporter of women's rights because he deeded properties directly to his female friends without including their husband's name. Those who received property from him included Mary Chase Walker Morse, Bertha Bernard, Sarah Jane Burr, Mary Gatewood, Henrietta Heck, Pauline Manasey, Polly Ann Nottage, Nellie Pasco, Henrietta Schiller, Emma Solomon, and Mary Taggart. In many cases, these are the only mentions of these women's names. He even gave his wife Matilda title of 36 lots in his Roseville development. Lewis and Matilda Rose lived in a two-story house on the plaza in Old Town, which he purchased from the widow Sarah Robinson. Today, a reconstruction of this building serves as Old Town State Historic Park headquarters, called the Robinson Rose Building. An interesting connection between Old Town families is the fact that Juana Machado Wrightington, San Diego's traditional doctor, helped Matilda Rose with medical care during the birth of at least one Rose daughter. If the official historical records do not include a group of people, does that mean they had only a marginal or trivial role? The essential contribution of women to the frontier colony of San Diego included establishment of gardens and orchards, family and community cooking, textile production, including spinning, weaving, and sewing, medical care for the community, religious instruction, and education. That's hardly a trivial contribution. An often overlooked contribution was the role of California women to negotiate among diverse groups that had differing and sometimes hostile agendas. Bernarda Ruiz, taught to read by San Diego's Apolinaria Lorenzana, acted as a liaison between the Californios and the Americans to negotiate a peace agreement. Bernarda had connections with many Californio families and was well respected. She was present when the Treaty of Coinga was signed in 1847. Her advice was to promote mercy and a peaceful transition of governments. She is one example of how California women worked quietly and confidentially behind the scenes to mend rifts and establish peace and welfare to benefit everyone. The location where the treaty was signed is a California historical landmark. But Bernarda Ruiz is not mentioned in the text of the marker, nor is she ever shown in illustrations of the event. But she was there and was publicly acknowledged as the key negotiator. So let's talk a little bit about some of these California families of Old Town and the women who were part of those families. But first, we're going to talk about the Estudio family. Maria Victoria Dominguez was the matriarch of the family and a prominent California woman. Maria Victoria was born at the Presidio of San Diego in 1801 
and married Jose Antonio Estudillo in 1824. Jose Antonio was a lieutenant and Maria Victoria was the daughter of a sergeant. They built their adobe home on the plaza in Old Town in around 1827, 1828, adding to it as their family grew. Their home was considered a show place along with the nearby Bandini residence. In addition to their home in San Diego, the Estudillo family had several land grants and two additional homes. During the Mexican-American War, Jose Antonio lived at their home in El Cajon, while Maria Victoria stayed in Old Town to encourage the townspeople to stay strong. She was widowed in 1852, at which time she had 10 children in the home between the ages of five and 22. Maria Victoria was well known as a religious person with high morals, and she was generous and kind to those in need. She showed great charity to immigrants, providing support for those coming to the region in search of gold and riches. In addition to her own children, she adopted the four children of Miguel Pedrarina after he and his wife died between 1850 and 1851. And she adopted the five Roca children who were orphaned by their parents' deaths in 1851. And the following year, 1852, her own husband died, leaving her with a large family and ranchos to manage. Maria Victoria managed her San Diego home for 21 years after her husband's death. Her 10 children all became civic leaders in San Diego and throughout California. She died in 1873, leaving 30 grandchildren and 12 great-grandchildren. The San Diego newspaper, The Daily World, published a lengthy obituary that declared one of the early heroines of Southern California has passed away. Her home was restored in 1909 under the supervision of architect Hazel Wood Waterman. For many years, it was known as Ramona's Marriage Place after the book Ramona by Helen Hunt Jackson. So you can see that the hands of women are felt throughout the S Studio home. The Casa de Estudio Adobe National Historic Landmark is the main museum in Old Town. And many exhibits in the rooms show the development of the building over time. During peak tourist season, it is visited by thousands of people every day. At the time the Estudio family lived in the home, there would not have been this decorative garden in the inner courtyard. There was a kitchen garden, animal pens, and probably a washing or bathhouse. However, when Hazelwood Waterman restored the building, she was inspired by the restored garden at Rancho Bohomi Adobe with its fountain and landscape. And, th and that's what you're seeing today, the, the vision of Hazelwood Waterman um, inspired by Rancho Bohomi. And just as an aside, Rancho Bohomi Adobe which is located, it's a county park located in Vista, is also a national historic landmark. Now we'll talk about the Bandini family. Juan Bandini was the son of Jose Bandini, a native of Spain who came to California on the Reina de los Angeles to defend Monterey from pirates. On November 20th, 1822, he married Maria de los Dolores Estudillo, the sister of Jose Antonio Estudillo. San Diego was quite the small town where a lot of these families ended up intermarrying. Maria de los Dolores was baptized in the Presidio Chapel. In 1829, the family built a large adobe home at the corner of the plaza. This family was socially prominent in the growing town and they set a social pace for others to follow. They had five children, 
before Maria de los Dolores died in 1833 at the age of 28. Their three daughters were well known as charming and beautiful young women. One, Isadora, married K. Johnson Couts after reportedly falling into his arms from a balcony. And Isadora and Kay ended up living up at Rancho Guajami, which I, I just mentioned. So again, you're seeing lots and lots of interconnections. After the death of his first wife, Juan Bandini married the much younger Refugia Arguello and had five additional children. Refugia loved to give large parties and continued the trend of the Bandini home as a social center of the community. And the Bandini home was also the focus of political activity and intrigue. Juan Bandini supported the American cause during the long conflict over who would govern California. The Bandini home was the site of Pio Pico's arrest in 1838 while Pico was in town to participate in the annual Christmas pageant, playing the devil. The family was forced to sell their home in 1859 due to financial difficulties. In 1869, it was converted to a hotel with the addition of a second story. The Cosmopolitan Hotel still stands in Old Town very much as you see it in this picture. Between 2007 and 2010, archaeological investigations were conducted in the area where the Bandini family had their kitchen. This work was done as part of the restoration of the Cosmopolitan Hotel. A few years ago, I did research on foods that would have been prepared and consumed by a typical California family. As a result of the archeological work and my research, we know much more about California cooking methods and diet. An archeological exhibit funded by donations was created to show food preparation activities. The exhibit is currently located in the end room of the Cosmopolitan Hotel, literally above where the Bandini kitchen was located. And unfortunately, the Cosmopolitan is currently closed. Um, we're hoping that in the near future, you'll be able to go in through the bar area and look at this exhibit. The Machado family. In 1835, the Casa de Machado e Stewart, as it's known today, was built by Jose Manuel and Maria Serafina Valdez de Machado. His father, Jose Manuel Orchaga y Machado, was a leather jacket soldier who arrived in California in 1781 from Sonora, Mexico. He married Maria de la Luz Valenzuela. Their oldest son, Jose Manuel Machado, was assigned to the Presidio of San Diego around 1806. Six of their children most likely lived in what we now know as the Machado Stewart home. By the time it was built, the oldest children were married and most likely had homes of their own. Uh, this adobe is now operated as a museum. Their youngest daughter, Rosa Maria Machado, who lived from 1828 to 1893, inherited the home. She married John Collins Stewart in 1845 and raised their children in a small two-room adobe house. Rosa lived in the house until her death in 1898, and the family lived there well into the late 20th century. The house included a garden, an orchard, livestock, including sheep. They raised everything they needed except for flour, sugar, and molasses. As was a common practice, Rosa kept an altar set up in the home. The Machados hired Kumeyaay women to help in the house, including 15-year-old Manita, 
and a woman named Carmel Searle, who lived on a ranch in Mission Valley after her marriage. Stewart was the shipmate of Richard Henry Dana, the author of Two Years Before the Mast. That book describes the life of a sailor between 1834 and 1836 aboard the brig Pilgrim. Stewart also served aboard the Alert before leaving the sea life to pursue the hide trade in San Diego. He was one of the men sent by Commodore Stockton to meet Kearney and participated in the Battle of San Pasqual. The house has an eight-sided ship spar used as a support beam in the main room. This tapering beam was probably added by Stewart with his background as a sailor, harbor pilot, and carpenter. The family remembered that Stuart did not care for tortillas, but liked his bread baked daily in the outside oven. Family members also remember there was always a coffee grinder in the house. Rosa had a large garden and orchard in the back of the building where she grew figs, pomegranates, grapes, and olives. The olives were pressed and the family made Castilian soap from some of the oil. Members of the Machado family also kept brined olives in a spring house near where the Old Town train station is now located. The Casa Machado E. Stewart home is the only museum in Old Town that focuses solely on a California family. The San Diego chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution received a grant from the DuPont Fund to improve exhibits in the kitchen and dining room and obtained additional chapter donations to restore the garden. Exhibit improvements include custom-made dishes, a dry sink, and a dining table. Three of the other daughters of Jose Manuel and Maria Serafina received lots around the plaza and built homes for their families. It's possible that the daughters were given these lots as wedding gifts. Juana de Dios Machado, baptized in 1814 at Mission San Diego, died in 1901, married Damasio Alipas, who died in Mexico, and then, as a 27-year-old widow, married Thomas Ridington. Her adobe home is on the plaza and is now operated as a concession. Ridington became a Catholic and Mexican citizen to marry her. She was a healer and a folk doctor and took care of the Battle of San Pasqual wounded when they arrived in Old Town. She also went with Father Ubach to the rancherias. She's often referred to as the Florence Nightingale of Old Town. Juana was fluent in Spanish, English, and Kumeyaay languages. Around 1850, Juana made a quilt that combines native, Mexican, and American elements. The red and white applique quilt was probably sewn by several hands. Her second husband, Thomas Ridington, ran a dry goods store, and she probably had access to cotton muslin and dyed wool fabric. Quilts like she made have no origins in colonial Spain. It appears that her applique pattern has much in common with the traditional culture designs of abstract flowers and vines placed on the surface of plain fabric. She may also have been inspired by native baskets in the placement of her designs. As a folk doctor, she traveled to San Diego's Kumeyaay Rancherias with Father Ubar. The applique method is typical of American quilts from this time in which small stitches are used to attach a large central flower cluster with leaf pieces and vines along the edges. Her design is similar to the medallion style of applique quilt. She used solid color red wool twill and red cotton fabric for the applique on plain white cloth. This color choice is also typical 
for American quilts of that time. The binding is a red twill fabric. According to quilt researchers, more than one quilter contributed to the, to the project using both white and red thread to attach the applique pieces with varying stitch sizes. The quilt seems to vibrate with movement and color and has many elements found in Mexican textiles of the time period. Juana's blending of native Spanish, Mexican and American cultures in her work exemplifies what's important about California traditions. As did other California women, she adapted and combined cultural traditions to create something new and unique. Her masterpiece has been reproduced by the Old Town San Diego Quilters Guild, who you see here, and is on display in Threads of the Past, which is located in Old Town San Diego State Historic Park. And we're very grateful that the original quilt is curated by the San Diego History Center. In 2021, I was able to study the quilt as part of a group of Old Town volunteers. The red wool twill fabric is still bright and sound, while the red cotton muslin has faded and is deteriorated. I was not able to see enough of the batting to determine its composition, but it appears to be cotton. This wool and cotton fabric was imported into Old Town by 1850 when the quilt was made. The common belief that Juana dyed these fabrics was not supported by my analysis because the color turkey red, as it's called, on the cotton fabric is only obtained through really complex processes that would not have been used or available to the home dyer. Maria Antonia Juliana Machado, baptized in 1815 at Mission San Diego, died in 1887, married Jose Antonio Nicasio Silvas, a Presidio soldier, who later deserted the family. She then married Enos Wall and turned the front rooms of the home into a restaurant and saloon called the Commercial Restaurant. The restaurant served whatever Maria Antonia was cooking that day. Sailors and traders purchased a ticket for a meal and ate what was served or they didn't eat. The restaurant also had a bar and offered gambling. This home was also called Casa de la Bandera because of the family story that Maria Antonia rushed out of the house and pulled the Mexican flag off the flagpole to save it as the Americans were coming into Old Town after the Battle of the Beach Road. Maria Antonia had a large garden behind the home and an altar niche in an interior wall. Later, her daughter Lorenza Silvas O'Neill lived there with her husband Patrick. The Casa de Machado y Silva's adobe shows what the commercial restaurant looked like when Maria Antonia served food and beverages. A beautiful wall painting in the kitchen area, which was discovered during archaeological investigations at the adobe, has been reproduced in the museum. The back part of the adobe, where the family lived, is in the process of getting new exhibits that will show how. Maria Antonia and her family lived in the back of the building while serving food at the commercial restaurant. Maria Guadalupe Ildefonso Machado, baptized in 1820 at Mission San Diego, died in 1884, married Peter Wilder, who died, and then Albert B. Smith in 1850. Smith passed away in 1867. Wilder purchased a home from Andres Ibarra in 1846. And this is often referred to as the Ibarra Wilder Smith House. 
and it's located, or it was located, at the corner of Mason and Wan Streets across from what is now the blacksmith shop. But after Wilder's death and Guadalupe's remarriage, the family moved to the Machado Smith home, which was built by Albert Smith at the corner of Old Beach Road and Garden Street. And that location is across from the Robinson Rose Park Visitor Center. It's currently vacant, vacant land. The property was granted to Maria Guadalupe Wilder as a widow in 1847 and then deeded to Smith in 1851. Um, there was an adjacent adobe residence in addition to the frame home. This property had a very large garden and orchard. Dolores Wilder married Dr. D.B. Hoffman and they lived in this home until 1869. Hoffman was an old town surgeon who also sold medical supplies and personal care items. Unfortunately, Maria Guadalupe's two adobe homes are no longer standing. Recent archeological investigations failed to discover significant evidence for the buildings constructed by Maria Guadalupe and Albert Smith near the Robinson Rose Visitor Center. And so the reconstruction is currently on hold. In addition to these women who have left us their homes and sites to remember them by, there are many other women in Old Town who contributed to San Diego's cultural heritage. I want to talk about a few of those people. Apollinaria Lorenzana, also called La Beata, was one of 11 female foundlings sent from Mexico in 1800. She lived in Old Town and at the mission into the 1830s. She had a significant role supervising work at the mission and taking care of the priests. She made sure that activities such as cooking, garment production and livestock care were taught and properly done. And in reward, she was given significant properties and ranchos in the San Diego and Southern California regions. Doña Lugarda Delgado taught sewing and embroidery to the other women of Old Town. Hand sewing was the only way clothing could be made from raw materials and much time was spent constructing attractive, long-lasting attire. Eugenia Silvis's adobe home was located where Sheriff James McCoy built a frame house as a wedding present for his wife, Winifred. The McCoy house was reconstructed by state parks next to the plaza behind the Robinson Rose Visitor Center and is currently a museum that shows all the time periods of Old Town. In addition, we also have the many female members of the Carrillo, Marone, Lopez, Pico, Alvarado, Serrano, Rodriguez, Altamirano, Aguirre, and many other families that all included wives, mothers, and daughters who quietly contributed to San Diego's cultural heritage. And of course, there were many other women living in what we know as Old Town San Diego, in addition to those previously mentioned. Some were born here and some arrived from other states and other nations. Maria Feliciano Valdez was the daughter of a Kumeyaay woman and a Presidio soldier. She married Jose Maximo Reyes in 1816 at the mission, and they built an adobe home near the Casa Machado East Stewart in the 1840s. And unfortunately, that adobe is no longer standing. Native American women were an important part of the community. In addition to relationships with California men through marriage, there were many Kumeyaay houses throughout Old Town. Some were made of adobe blocks and others 
in a more traditional style. Many of the native people were merchants, traders, chefs, housekeepers, and childcare providers. We see their names in the 1850 and 1852 census records. Anita Freeman, the daughter of Black entrepreneur and deputy city marshal Richard Freeman, was the proprietor of a saloon after her father's death. Freeman and his partner, Alan Light, founded the Light Freeman Saloon, also called the California House, in the mid 1840s. Anita inherited the building and operated the saloon alone after the death of her father in 1851 until 1857. Alan Light, had arrived in California in 1835 with papers that certified him as free man and citizen of the United States of America. These papers were known as a sailor's protection from being seized and thrown into slavery. Women were teachers, merchants, storekeepers, and tradespeople. Their families owned stores in Old Town or provided services. Albert Seeley and his wife operated the stage line between San Diego and Los Angeles from his stable and later purchased the Bandini home and turned it into the Cosmopolitan Hotel. His wife, Emily Walker, was born in Manchester, England. Other women of Old Town were Lana Trimmer, whose husband Martin was from Prussia, Perfecta Ames, the blacksmith's wife, Matilda Dodson, Monica Dakota, Josefa Correa de Fitch, who ran the Fitch store after her husband's death. Mary Chase Walker, who in 1865 was Mason Street School's first teacher, only taught 11 months until she left her post when she married Ephraim W. Morse. Prior to her resignation, she caused a controversy by having lunch at the Franklin House with a woman identified by restaurant patrons as being of mixed race. Diners stormed out in protest and school enrollment plummeted. Both Spanish and Mexican law gave women the right to own property after marriage. They did not need the consent of their husbands to execute documents. This situation changed after California became a state in 1850, when their husbands gained control over their fortunes and properties through the practice of coverture. These women then began to slip into invisibility. One day I was spinning fiber into yarn in Old Town as part of the living history programs run by the park along with quilters, embroiderers, soap makers, cooks, and other women volunteers. A male volunteer looked around and said, there were never this many women here. I immediately wondered why he would have that impression. So that's when I started investigating. As you can tell by this presentation, the notion that there were very few women in Old Town San Diego has been proven to be incorrect. The men who wrote the history books saw them as having no separate or individual identity. Unfortunately, we don't know the names of many of the women of Old Town because it was thought not to be important. The best way for us to bring attention to these women is to remember them, document their presence and contributions, and preserve the places where they lived and worked. I want to thank the San Diego History Center for your interest in this subject and for your support in our study of the Juana Machado quilt. I would also like to acknowledge and thank these people whose research contributed to this presentation. And I'd like to thank the boosters of Old Town also known as Boot, and the San Diego chapter of the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. These organizations have contributed significant funding towards preserving 
the homes of the women of Old Town. Thanks. Oh, one more thing. Can I add one more thing? Yes, yeah, um, yes. <laughs> I wanted to put in a plug for the American Quilt Study Group Conference coming to San Diego in October. And I'm going to be um, giving a discussion on California fabrics and textiles on October 2nd. So if you're interested, you can go to AmericanQuiltStudyGroup.org and get information. Um, but uh, I'll be covering a little bit of the material um, that I talked about today, but mostly I'll be talking about uh, the different fabrics and textiles that were made during the California period um, and then showing some examples of my interpretation of those fabrics. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions already. So we have come to the question part of our presentation here. So if you have something that you are uh, wanting to get an answer to, please pop it in the Q&A and we will get to as many as we have time for. Um, the first one I saw reaches all the way back to the beginning of your presentation. Um, the question is, how did Maria Victoria Dominguez earn enough to care for so many children? How many employees <laughs> did she have? and um, for the rancho and the children and how many children I think. Oh, well, the exact number of, of children since she adopted so many children is a matter of some debate. Um, she was very generous, as I say, in supporting not only her own children by birth, but also um, various people who were orphans. As you can imagine, there were a lot of orphans at the time. And the, the money that was, most of the money that was made by, by ranchers at, as such as the Estudios was in the hide and tallow trade. So the, the, the real money was in cattle and the, the hide of the cattle was, was traded to the Eastern United States where they made various leather products. Interestingly enough, a lot of that leather ended up coming back to California as shoes, saddles and other items. Um, the tallow was used for candles. So oftentimes there were, there were just, there was so much hide and tallow being harvested that they would slaughter the animals and just leave the carcasses out there. Cause they really, the meat, they couldn't eat that much meat. I mean, they ate a lot of beef, but they couldn't eat that much beef. So the real value in the, in the cattle was in the hide and the tallow. And that's how these folks made their money. Remember, there was no income tax yet. So um, <laughs> their profits were theirs to keep. Do you know how many employees were on the ranchos? I don't, I don't. It, you know, and that kind of brings up another interesting subject, which is the census records. You know, of course there were no census records until 1850, and then there was another census in 1852. And those records do list a number of people in what was then San Diego County. San Diego County was much bigger then. It included Imperial, Riverside, San Bernardino, parts of Los Angeles, and Orange Counties. So the tough part is getting into those census records and kind of teasing everybody, uh, everybody apart. Um, so that's, that's research yet to be done. Um, I think the information is there. We also have a lot of descriptions from the family members themselves about, you know, all the vaqueros and all the people who lived out on the ranches and managed the livestock. So um, typically the, for example, the sheep, the shearing took place on the ranches and then the wool would be brought into town for processing. But in terms of the people, we just really don't know. We had some anecdotal information from like Rancho Hamul and places like that, but, but not a lot of comprehensive information. It, to kind of piggyback on that regarding the census, there's a question, um, what is the percentage of women to men in the 1850 census? Do you know? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So the 1850 census includes the garrison in San Diego, and also everybody who was at the barracks at the mission. And so men are really, really overrepresented as far as, from my perspective, because of all the soldiers. And you can look and see their names. Of course, they were from all over the place. They're from Illinois, 
you know, here and there, every, all, all different parts of the U.S. Um, what so, sort of my next step is to go into the census and again, try to tease apart some of this information, eliminate the, the military presence, which by the way, also included some women. There were some women and their families in those companies. So tease that apart. I try to identify the more central occupants of San Diego as opposed to the rest of what the county. And that's, you know, I would suspect, and again, I haven't done that work yet, but I would suspect the proportion is pretty much what you'd expect in them in town, you know, with the wives and the daughters and uh, et cetera. Thank you. We've got um, a question about the, um, the dye process you mentioned. Um, you said that there was some debate about it. Can you elaborate on that a little? Sure. When um, <clears throat> there was some, uh, when the, the Juana Machado's quilt was first being studied, um, the assumption was that she had dyed the red fabric. And that's really not feasible because of the dye process involved in the, the muslin, co dyeing cotton fabric, that turkey red color. Turkey red was a, a process that was perfected in, in India. It's called Turkey after the country of Turkey, although it was actually perfected in India. And the, the materials used were um, a natural plant root matter, M-A-D-D-E-R, not matter, but matter. So matter root. But more than that, it also included a lengthy process that was a proprietary method that remained a secret in India until um, it was sort of leaked out during the Industrial Revolution. And then Scotland became the center for the production of turkey red fabrics. Uh, there were all kinds of rumors about what, what went into turkey red. I think a lot of it was, you know, kind of hogwash, uh, you know, like ox blood and this and that secret ingredient and everything. But the, the bottom line was it was a pretty sophisticated industrial process that really would not have been used by the home dyer. Plus, we also have receipts and um, inventories of dye stuffs, and it doesn't include anything, anything like that. We know also that that those types of fabrics were coming in on the ships at the time. We can look at the ship manifests. I mentioned the alert, um, which uh, Stuart was on. Um, we have the manifest from those ships. And so we know that enormous quantities of fabrics were coming in, um, you know, initially from the, on the Manila galleons and later from the East Coast and from England. So they, they had, she, she had access to to red wool twill fabric and red muslin. That's a that's such an interesting part of the story of that. It, you know, something that's kind of a comment that people assume, and then you look into the record, and that's not doesn't hold up. Right. Well, you know, you, you really have to dig deep into that stuff. And and as someone, you know, when I was doing my studies on these fabrics and textiles, you know, I wanted to replicate them, and I also wanted to understand what was involved and some of the processes, you know, you're like, uh, you know, there's no evidence that there was a dye house in Old Town. There's no evidence that those dyes were imported into, into California. So you just have to kind of dig a little deeper into the facts. Shifting gears just a little bit, um, are there any diaries, letters or other writings that you know of from San Diego, California women? Yeah, but one of the sources I used was a book called um, Testimonials. And uh, let's see, I could actually probably reach over and grab it off my shelf. But, but it, it was edited by Rosemarie Beebe and Robert Senkowitz, 2006 Testimonials, Early California Through the Eyes of Women, 1815 to 1848 by Heyday Books. 
I would I bet in early California through the eyes of women. Yeah, I would strongly recommend that book. It's it's absolutely it, it is absolutely fascinating to hear their own voices. Um, so so that that was a book that I really enjoyed looking at and gave me a real sense of who these people who these people were. Wonderful. Um, one other question here about um, the Casa de Bandini, if there are any photos of it before it became a hotel. There's that, that, that oh, so those overview photos, like the one at the beginning of, uh, of my presentation, and, and it, it, shows, it shows the adobe, but, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things about this time period, of course, is that uh, photography was in its infancy. And so we were just talking about that the other day when we were at the McCoy house, that there's really no interior photos, right? Because <laughs> lighting was a problem. There were a lot of issues. So the only real good photos that we have that I've seen of, of the actual Bandini home are those, those overviews taken from somewhere up by the Presidio Hill. And you really have to kind of zoom in and look closely to see what was going on, so. Yeah, it's one of the one of the downfalls there when you start looking back too far. They just don't yeah. exist. <laughs> no photos. <laughs> Go figure. Um, there's a question here about a specific figure. Uh, if you have any information about Maria Estefania Alvarado Johnson, if you know that name. Yes. Um, so she is a fill associated with what Los Pinisquitos Ranch has. And it used to be called the Johnson Taylor Adobe. Now it's called Los Pinisquitos Ranch House, and that's a county park. It's a national register property. And there is a lot of information about her. Um, the county historian, Ellen Sweet, has done a huge amount of research on the family. And actually, that she has a, a wonderful um, genealogical display up at Pinisquitos Ranch House. So uh, yes, Ellen Sweet. And there is a book um, by Mary Ward, Los Pinisquitos on the Road to Yuma, that has information about the family as well. So um, there's a lot of information, mostly you know, in the archives of the county of San Diego because Pinisquitos is a county park. But again, you see all these people had these connections, right? They all connect. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, we've got another question here um, about um, if you can talk a little bit about the class differences among the women in Old Town. Well, the, of course, you know, as in any community, there are the wealthy people and the not very wealthy people. The wealthy people like the Bandinis and the Estudios had these very large houses. They were furnished with the finest furniture. If, if in the Casa de Estudio, if it could be brought to California, they had it. They had dishes from England, they had silk, they had carpeting, um, they had, again, logistics were the problem for them in getting stuff here. And then of course, there were people of the more, might, you might think of sort of the, the middle-class folks, the Machados, um, who lived in smaller residences and, and at the at sort of the very edge of things, people who were the servants and did the laundry and, and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, there, there were definitely class differences among the people in Old Town. What I thought was interesting, though, was that um, when uh, the, the Mary, Mary, I was I'm always tempted to call her Mary Chase Walker, but I guess people also call her Mary Walker Morse the school teacher, um, when she was, you know, she published her memoirs and when she described her school, children from all walks attended her school. Now that wasn't until 1865. Prior to that, during the California period, people were taught in their homes by their, by their parents or their mothers primarily um, in, a, in a less formal way. 
but at, but at the time that Mary Chase Walker Morse was teaching, she had pupils, you know, of every class and every background in her school. We've got a couple of related questions here, so I'm going to put them together. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about Native women in Old Town and any information about relationships between California women and Indigenous women. You touched on it a bit, but I think there's more interest in that question. Right, and, and that's another area I think that uh, you know deserves and requires more research. Um, we don't have a lot of names uh, for, the, for the Native women who lived in Old Town. Uh, typically, in the census records, they're listed as um, serve a servant in a household. Although intriguingly, there's a couple of families um, where, where they're not listed as servants and it's unclear what the relationship was. Uh, one of the comments uh, by a visitor to Old Town was that a lot of the native people lived in adobe houses and you know, had furnishings and, and, uh, and some preferred the more traditional lifestyle. So we, we don't really know very much about those details, which is really unfortunate. But the 1852 census has a lot more um, names of native people. So that's, again, something uh, that, that, that really deserves, I think, additional research and additional study. Tina mentioned in the chat, um, the index in Cal early California population project that might be helpful in regard to recovering indigenous names and identities. So it's a great resource there for folks if you're interested in that topic. Um, there is a specific question about a specific person, um, Ertrudis Alto. Um, so that person might be served by looking in that index perhaps, unless you know about that specific person. I don't, I don't. All right. Um, and it looks like we've got a few more questions. If we've got a little bit of time here, I'm gonna, um, read through and, and grab a couple for you as we finish up. Um, one question here that about, um, I'm sorry, women's being buried in the cemetery in Old Town, would their graves have been marked with any identifying information? Well, there were, there were three cemeteries. There was Campo Santo, which is owned by the city of San Diego. And there are definitely women buried in there. And um, you know, research has provided us with their names. There was the cat, the uh, Protestant cemetery, which my looking at the old maps. In fact, it's funny because I was just looking at the old maps that show the locations of the other two cemeteries. The Protestant cemetery was near the intersection of what's now five and eight hundred five. And then the Jewish cemetery was down near where Liberty Station is currently. And I'm not aware of any information on individuals buried in those two, but, but there is information on who was buried in Campo Santo, the, the, the individuals. Um, Lawrence Riverall did that research and I believe, you know what, I used to have that information and I actually, gave it to the Old Town Descendants Group because it's their family. Uh, but, but a gentleman named Lawrence Riverall uh, did a lot of research on that. And um, you know, people who have been in San Diego a long time may remember seeing little crosses in the street outside of Campo Santo where people were buried outside the wall and um, and as far as I know, those graves are still there. So, but anyway, the answer is um, the only information that I'm aware of on who is buried in the Old Town cemeteries is, is for Campo Santo. And we've got to wrap up, but I've got one last question here. Um, if you can talk about if, if there was any um, negativity or, or if it was frowned upon for Mexican women who married non-Mexican men you're talking a lot about different marriages and families coming together, I think. Oh, yeah. That, that, as far as I can tell, it was uh, open season, you know. <laughs> and as you can see from the talk, there was a lot of um, mortality and remarriages. So people um, would get married or maybe not married. There were some of these people where, you know, I may 
I'm saying they married, whether they could marry, of course, because in the Catholic Church, uh, if your husband sort of take, you know, disappears and doesn't show up anymore, do you remarry? Is it a marriage? And that kind of thing. But um, as in as in most communities at that time, I think there was a lot of um, flexibility in marriage partners. Other people, you know, like one family I didn't even get a chance to talk about was um, um, Augustin Horosti, who was the first county sheriff, and he and his wife were from Hungary. And so a lot of these families arrived with, with their spouses present and, uh, and other people, you know, like uh, John Colin Stewart took the opportunity to uh, find somebody local. Well, I think that was the last question we've cut time for. I know there's a few more in there. I'm so sorry we, we've run out of time, but if you still have a question um, and you would like to find out more, you can always try our website. You can do a search right into the search bar in our website and it will pop up with journal articles and past exhibitions, lots of great resources. And of course, we're here to help as well. I've dropped a few links into our chat um, where you can find some of the information that you might be looking for. And um, if you are interested in seeing some of our past programs, or if you're interested in watching this or sharing this program again, um, it, it will be on our YouTube channel within a few days here. So please do utilize those links, those resources. And if you have any questions, you can always email education at sandiegohistory.org and I'll point you in the right direction. So thank you so much for joining us today. And please join us again next month. Um, you can see the registration in there um, in the chat as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Hector. It was fantastic. Um, I know we all learned a lot and people have lots more burning questions. So uh, we'll, point some, we'll point them in your direction if, if we get some um, via the, the email here. So thank you so much and we'll see you next time.